Live from the Business Radio X studio inside Renaissance Bank, the bank that specializes in understanding you. It's time for North Fulton Business Radio. And hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of North Fulton Business Radio. I'm John Ray, and we are coming to you from the Business Radio X studio inside Renaissance Bank. And folks, you're connected today more than ever whether it's your friends, your family, or your life, Renaissance understands how you bank, offering the mobile banking services you need. Renaissance also knows that sometimes you need to speak to real people with real answers, and that's why Renaissance has more than 190 convenient locations throughout the South ready to serve you. For more information, go to renaissancebank.com, Renaissance Bank, understanding you, member FDIC. And now let's turn to two great guests, uh, very involved in business matters, small business matters. Uh, in fact, one of them has that name, uh, Tim Fulton with Small Business Matters and Anthony Chin. And Anthony is with Lighthouse Financial Network and a big announcement coming from Anthony here shortly. Uh, but first let's go to Tim Fulton. Tim is with Small Business Matters. Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be with you and your your audience today. Yeah, it's great to have you here. And you come uh, with a lot of great experience that I've been excited to have you share. So talk about what you do. Sure. Well, John, I started off my career as a as a serial entrepreneur, about the first third of my career, starting, growing, and then exiting uh, small businesses and, and enjoyed that. And then I found that as much as I enjoyed starting my own business. I enjoyed being around other small business owners. And so I began counseling, mentoring, coaching other small business owners. And that then developed into a consulting practice called Small Business Matters that I've now had, I think, over for over 25 years. That's terrific, uh, Tim. And, and one thing you said there that I don't think people fully appreciate is you actually successfully exited businesses because a lot of people don't get to do that. So you're bringing that experience to bear on the folks you deal with. That's, that's very true. And, and I've, you know, I was fortunate and, and, and lucky as well that I got to choose my exit for each of the businesses. I find many small businesses. That's not the case is that they end up exiting not on their terms, but on someone else's terms, which is unfortunate. And, and can have a huge impact on the, you know, what they're able to take away uh, upon exit. Well, you've been in the trenches and you know what a lot of the myths are about entrepreneurship. Share some of those that people need to know about before they jump in. Sure. Well, I, I've made every mistake possible for a small business. And that's why I, I guess what something I bring to my clients is that experience of what works and, and what doesn't work. But I do find that many small business owners uh, fall into you know the trap of believing certain things about small business that just aren't aren't quite true. Uh, one of which is that uh, that it's going to get easier. That if I can just hang in for a little bit longer, this business will get easier. And the reality is, it never gets easier. And that's been documented by a good amount of research. In fact, in academia, they they refer to this as the growth paradox the belief that this business will get easier over time. And and the reality, it doesn't. And the easiest way, John, to explain it is to think of it this way, that if, if you were, you and I are in business and we're the only two, there are two lines of communication from me to you and you to me, two lines of communication. So now we add Anthony as our third employee, and now we have six lines of communication. Uh, we add a fourth person, we have 12 lines. So inherently, the business gets more complicated as we add employees, sure. as we add customers, as we add vendors. It can't help but get more complicated as as we grow the business. So that that's one myth that I try to dispel with with many of my clients. Yeah, and that's important. If uh, if I can, you're not talking about just the financial part of it. I mean, although uh, that may be an issue too. But it, it's really the organizational internal aspects of it that that folks don't fully appreciate uh, how complicated operations can get. Yeah, exactly. Every every component of the business gets more complicated 
as the business grows, or even if it doesn't grow, it's still going to get more and more difficult. So keep going. You, sure, you, you, sure. You've got more than that one, I know. You've got oh. some good ones for us, uh, Tim. There's another one that I, I find myth is that in order to be successful in business, I've got to be really smart, uh, very high IQ. And while that certainly might be important, again, uh, research indicates that that is not probably the most important uh, criteria for a successful business owner. In fact, there was a really interesting article a number of years ago in Entrepreneur Magazine. They took a group of small business owners and they said, okay, what is, what one quality, what one trait would be uh, most important? So the first thing they did is, well, they said it must be IQ, it must be smarts. So they tested the IQ of each of the uh, members of this group. And, and this was, good news for most of us, they found no correlation between IQ and success in small business. No correlation at all. I really feel good right I, now. I, Thank I, you I for that. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that today, Tim. And then, John, they said, well, if it's not if it's not IQ, maybe it is their EQ, their emotional quotient, which is the driver of success in small business. And I'm sure your listeners, many may be familiar with EQ, your emotional quotient, how well you get along with people. Um and you can actually, there's a way of measuring it, like your IQ. And so they tested the EQ of the same group of very successful small business owners. And in this case, they found some correlation between one's EQ and their potential for su- success in business. That makes sense. You find people who are successful or that's in business or in life, they get along with others. But it wasn't the, the silver bullet that they were looking for. So then they tried one more one more component, and that is your your AQ, your AQ. And again, they tested the same group and they found in this case, there was in fact a direct correlation between one's AQ and their potential for success in business. And you now, let's, define way, it. let's define AQ. Yeah. Though, what, what is AQ? Know that. Yeah. Okay. Well, your, your AQ is your adversity quotient. Ah. Your adversity quotient. How well do you deal with difficult situations? Maybe almost impossible situations. And in this case, they found a direct correlation between one's AQ and their potential for success in business. And what they found is people with high AQ, and there's actually a very simple assessment you can take if your listeners just do a Google on adversity quotient, they'll find it. And they found that people with very high AQ have a very similar mindset, a similar uh, mantra, so to speak. And it is uh, when facing a difficult situation, which we do practically every day, the mindset is, this too shall pass. Ah. I've, I've been in difficult situations before, mm-hmm. gotten through them. I'll get through this one. Mm. Dramatically different than those with with less than average um, uh, AQ. Their mindset tends to be, oh, my God, <laughs> this is it. I'm, I'm going to fail. I'll right. never get past this. Very different mindset. So people with that mindset, this idea that, uh, you know, I can get through this. I've been through difficult situations before. And what's interesting, John, is that there was a study that showed 20 years ago, the average adult, you and I, faced on average 8 to 10 difficult situations in any given day, adverse situations, any given day, that the car doesn't start, kids are sick, whatever the case might be. Today's world, that number is double. It's 16 to 20 adverse events for uh, the average adult. That's not a business owner. The average adult, it's 16 to 20 adverse events in any given day. Mm. So you can see why having this this high AQ would be so important, not just for the average adult, but for small business owners who probably face two or three times that many number of adverse events in, in any given day. So, again, just another myth that, that it's not so much about IQ, it's, it's, it's about AQ. Yeah, so follow up on that if I can. So what I don't hear you saying about AQ is that it's about toughness or something like that. It's it, it it's more about uh, even handedness or even uh, equanimity, if you will, in, in terms of the way you look at the world. I think you're right. I th- I think there's some element of toughness. There was a book that came out, a best selling book, a couple of years ago called Grit, and there was a TED talk that was done by the author, and she talked about the importance of having grit, having a, a toughness, and I think there may be some some alignment between that and and this adversity quotient but i think there's more to it than that as well i think you're right gotcha gotcha okay keep going you this is great sure so uh another one is that we, we just assume that small business owners entrepreneurs are risk takers uh, some people would talk, say crazy <laughs> but we tend to think of them as risk takers because they're they're willing to start this whole new venture and 
and and borrow money and hire people not knowing if they're going to be successful or not. But when they survey entrepreneurs, what they find is something very different. They find that most entrepreneurs, they don't see themselves as risk takers. They see themselves as opportunists. They, they see an opportunity in the market. They see something that no one else is doing and they can't figure out why. Why would we not all want to start this business in this market serving this this audience? So they do it. They start a business. And again, they don't see themselves as risk takers. They see themselves as, as opportunists, which allows them to, to maybe not take on the, the stress that, that risk takers you know, would naturally take on and in some cases be as successful as they are. Not so much risk takers, more opportunists. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Tim Fulton with Small Business Matters. Uh, you've given me about 18 follow-up questions that <laughs> I'm going to try to cram into the next uh, few minutes here. Uh, but I'd like to, uh, I guess, go back uh, just briefly, if I can, to uh, the adversity quotient. So are, is, is that something that you advise would-be entrepreneurs to test themselves for? Oh, yeah. I, I think that would be a very good idea to, to test themselves a, ahead of time just so they have like almost any type of behavioral assessment, s- just so they have some sense of their 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 makeup, you know, how they're wired um, before they go into the business. And if they take the assessment and find that it's, it's terribly low, then that might be a, a warning signal. It may not say, hey, don't do it, but at least do it knowing that you may struggle when it comes to adversity. Now, small business owners are known for not wanting to, uh, let's say, outsource a lot of things, right? Uh, and, and, and the leverage their own time. I, is that one of the key factors you find that's, that keeps small businesses from growing like they should? Or, or are there other things that we ought to know about? There are other factors, but John, that's a really important one. There's a study that found that, um, only Four percent of all small businesses ever get past a million dollars in revenue. A million dollars in revenue. So, for any of your listeners, if your annual revenue is more than four million dollars, you're you're in the four percent club. And then they study or more than one million, more than one million dollars in revenue. Okay, okay, you're, you're, what, you're the in the four percent club. club. Wow. And then they looked at that and said, okay, so what's going on? There's almost like this this barrier to growth that shows up for small businesses at about a million dollars in annual revenue. So they, they studied that to say, okay, what's, what's going on there? And what they found, the biggest issue is it's a, it's a leadership issue. And specifically, it's about delegation. You have the founder of the business is, is when they start the business, they're able to take on a variety of different roles, right? They're the, the, the chief sales officer, the chief financial officer, the chief marketing officer, all the C hats, they're wearing them, right? And some of them, uh, can do that for a period of time. But what they found is when a business gets to about a million dollars in annual revenue, uh, it gets to a point where it, it's, it's very hard to take on those roles. And the successful founders are willing to delegate. They're willing to hire uh, an operational person. They're, hi- they're willing to hire their first salesperson. Even though they know no one can do it as well as they can, they, they, they understand for that business to grow, to bust through that million dollar barrier, they've got to be willing to hand off certain, certain responsibilities within that business that either they're not really good at or they just need to find someone else to do it so that they can do what they're really good at. And I find for many business owners, it's really hard to, to, to hire that, that number two person, that operational person. Sometimes I, I refer to that as the adult in the room, you know, someone who's willing to come in and and run the business on a daily basis, which then allows the, the founder, the CEO to do whatever they do best, whether it's selling or building relationships, but it frees that person up to then grow that business beyond that $1 million mark. Uh, now, Tim, uh, again, folks, we're talking with Tim Fulton, and he is with Small Business Matters. And, Tim, I can hear a few listeners in my ear right now saying, would you get on to asking Tim how he works with businesses? Because he, you're blowing me away with some great information and I could, I could keep going there. But, uh, talk about how you engage with businesses and you've got a, a various ways that you help out folks. Sure. Sure. Well, uh, once or twice a year, I host a, a training program. It's called the Small Business Matters Bootcamp. 
It's a program that I've been doing in, in, in different shapes and sizes for over 15 years. We've got over 3,000 small business owners who've gone through the program nationwide. It's 40 hours, five full days on everything from business planning, uh, marketing, leadership, uh, management, financial management, and organizational design. So that, that boot camp, if you're, if any of your listeners are interested, uh, there's more information available on the Small Business Matters uh, website. Uh, John, I also host a conference once a year in, in May. Uh, for six years, we've hosted this Small Business Matters conference. It's unique in that it is, it's like a TED conference, if your listeners are familiar with TED Talks. So each speaker, there are usually a dozen different speakers. Each speaker talks for about 15 minutes on some element around mostly business, but sometimes uh non-business as well. So about a dozen different speakers, very fast-paced day. Typically, we'll have 200 or more guests that'll, that'll join us for that day. Great day for, for networking, for, for meeting new contacts, and for, for learning uh, a lot around business. So we have the boot camp. We have the conference. Also, each month, I host a, uh, a lunch for small business owners. It's called Small Business Matters. At lunch, we bring in a speaker for about a half hour so they get some good content. They get to meet other small business owners and, and trusted advisors. And it's just a, it's a, just a fun time as well. That's fantastic work. So, uh, for those that want more information, Tim, on any of these, uh, programs that you offer, conferences, what have you, uh, let them know how they can be in touch. Yeah. Thanks, John. It's smallbusinessmattersonline.com. That's the website smallbusinessmattersonline.com. I should also mention that I have an, a newsletter that we've published now for almost 20 years, Small Business Matters. comes out once a month, and uh, if any of your listeners are interested, again, they can visit the website, smallbusinessmattersonline.com, and subscribe, and we'd be happy to add them to the, the distribution. That's fantastic. Tim Fulton, he's with Small Business Matters. Thanks so much for being here. Very welcome. Thank you. Folks, if you need help curing headaches like Tim talked about uh, of those headaches might include administrative tasks bookkeeping marketing presentations well here's an answer for you go engage a smart and reliable office angel they're not a temp agency or a placement firm office angels matches your business support needs with angels who have the talent and experience necessary to help you maintain and grow your business on an ongoing or as needed basis your terms, your timeline, they lend a hand when needed and fly off when the job is done. Find out more at officeangels.us or call Chief Executive Angel SES Cabido at 770-442-9246. And now we turn to Anthony Chin. Anthony is with Lighthouse Financial Network. Anthony, welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So tell us a little bit about you and... Lighthouse Financial Network. What do you do there? Well, I'm one of the financial advisors there, and what we do is the metaphor I like using a lot is uh, being the GPS or financial GPS for our clients. Um, everyone knows how a GPS works. They have a destination in mind. So the analogy I like using is that all at the destination, whether it be retirement or how in the world I'm going to be able to afford for my kids' education if I still have student loans of my own, I'm the one to show them to get there. Lots of financial advisors out there. I don't need to tell you that. Talk about how your approach is different maybe from others. Well, I focus very much on the lifestyle or I preach about the quality of life. Uh, a lot of people focus so much on the returns and the fees here and that. At the end of the day, I focus on, well, what makes my client happy? What is their definition of happiness and quality of life? And when I bring that open-ended question up, I get all kinds of answers. Uh, a lot of the clients I use uh, as an example that, that really motivates and inspires me as to why I do what I do is I have a client uh, out in Long Island who is right at the age of 71, well, actually turning 72 this year. He's still out there drag racing. <laughs> he goes to Watt, Watkins Glen. And I'm thinking, I want to be that. Well, I'm going to be my son. No I'm kidding. That Talking about grit. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. That's cool. Now, so... I guess what I hear you saying is that money is not unimportant, but money has a purpose. Yes. And that's what you try to get to with clients mm -hmm. and really understanding their why as to what is this bucket of money for? Most people have either, well, I want to 
feel secure and not have to worry about daily bills, or they have a, a specific number in mind and say, well, I want to be able to have this to provide a better future either for my kids or grandkids that I didn't have an opportunity for. So these are all the values and quality of life concerns I bring out of my clients and understand. But Anthony, if I pull money out to go buy a new drag racer or something <laughs> like that, then that means less fees for you. You're not going to advocate for that for me, are you? Oh, that's what I tell them. Fun. I, I, I would earn less, but if my clients are happy, that's my job. It's at the end of the day, uh, a kind of tongue in cheek joke with people is that you can't take it with you. Uh, I, I don't, I have yet to see bags of money being dragged behind hers. So yes. I, I want to make sure my clients, believe it or not, is that they get to enjoy the fruits of their labor, which is why I'm such a big preacher or kind of harp a little too much sometimes about what is their quality of life. We're speaking with Anthony Chen and Anthony is with Lighthouse financial network uh and he's here in atlanta in the atlanta area so what would what's the one thing that folks ought to know when they work with a financial advisor that you would tell them they need to be aware of they want you to make sure that the advisor is understanding their purpose of what it's not again so much focusing on any xyz amount of products or features and bells and whistles but whether or not the advice or the recommendation that they've been provided will meet their specific goals. And even more important before that is whether or not the advisor you're having a conversation with has a very clear picture and concise picture of what their goals or success of their goals look like. And goals going beyond just monetary goals. As you mentioned, uh, what, what, what purpose do they have in retirement or what have you in, in their life? What meaning do they want to derive out of their, uh, the remaining years they use that money for? Certainly. And, and, kind of piggybacking on top of the small business uh, conversation. Some of them have an opportunity to jump on and recreate or rather reinvent themselves, going into another career or starting a business they've always had an, an inkling in the back of their head, but because of obligations from paying the mortgage, sending the kids to school, they have kind of trigger shy and say, well, I have these responsibilities. I don't want to take on unnecessary risk while my, I'm putting my kids through college. But my conversation with them is, well, your kids are out of school now. What better time than, you know, I'm looking at my watch. If not now, when? Right. Let's, let's make the best chapter of your life going forward. For sure. So, Anthony, we've got a big announcement with you. Right? We, we're going to uh, lay it. We've got breaking news here, as it were. <laughs> yeah. So, you are uh, about to start a new show here on Business Radio X called Family Business Radio. And we'll, we'll start uh, as we... Uh, broadcast this show it'll be uh next week here in mid-august but it'll be on podcast form out there for folks to hear tell us a little bit about what you're going to be doing with that show i'll, I'll be focusing a spotlight on two family businesses here in the local atlanta area and what really inspired it of that is kind of my origin story of how i got into doing what i'm doing but my dad wanted to have his own business so i want to be able to highlight of the family business being grown here in the atlanta area and sharing their successes and trials and tribulations so we can build a community. Sure. That business owners are not just out there by themselves, are wondering in the back of their heads, am I the only one thinking this or am I the only one uh, going through this? No, you're, you're, you're among friends. Right, right. And you're, you'll have folks that are the trusted advisors to family businesses too, that have fam, like you have family businesses as a specialty. And also we really highly and providing a uh, feedback or, or value to others listening in as well. You know, I never ever thought about that. Maybe mm -hmm. I should have a uh, delegation or bring this advisor along because it would actually help address this very problem I'm facing in my business. Sure, sure. So Family Business Radio, that's going to be coming here on uh, Business Radio X, uh, the North Fulton Studio, Business Radio X, and we'll have links in the show page for folks that are listening to this show. Uh, so you can follow, subscribe to that show, and, and uh, take a listen. We're looking forward to that. So uh, this is a pretty intimidating process, what you take folks through. How do people like take a deep breath and keep it from being as intimidating as it sometimes can be? Well, what we're kind of getting back to the original question of what is their their definition of quality of life or happiness. And sometimes people actually are a little taken back mm -hmm. by that. And that actually takes one or two meetings and really diving 
in deep as to what makes them genuinely happy rather than taking on a definition of what everyone else is doing. So for them to get get started, if they're married or, or, or what have you, they're having a conversation with their spouse and rather than just jumping into the nitty gritty details of the dollars and cents is, well, honey, what, what, what makes you happy? And try to find a compromise between them both and then work them backwards from there. So if they can get a very clear picture of what they want the scenario or the perfect win looks like, then we can go from there. But without that clear picture, no amount of advice that me or anyone else or, or wizardry can make that come true. Sure, sure. Now, back to one of uh, the points that Tim made earlier about delegation or, or lack of wanting to delegate. That seems to be a problem with uh, small business owners and their finances, too, right? I mean, because I take it the biggest competitor financial advisors have is doing nothing. <laughs> which is which is not a good strategy, right? So I had to talk to those folks that are out there and they're really afraid to go find a good financial advisor or have done nothing. Well, the conversation uh, got almost kind of repeated being a dead horse is finding an advisor that understands their why and for them is understanding what they want their legacy to be, which I find most in family businesses as well. I've Born sweat, blood, and tears to build up this business for this amount of years. I want to make sure that my values and my fundamentals and the way I created my business continues on. So it's having, making sure that the advisors they're having, not just financial, but attorneys and CPAs, that they're all uh, aligned on the same philosophy and the values that the business owner have. And that is the best team that you can definitely construct from there. Because without that same shared philosophy, it's probably not going to work. Anthony Chen, and he's with Lighthouse Financial Network. Anthony, great words here. So for those that would like more information, would like to be in touch, how do they do that? Uh, you can reach me by email, which is just my full name, Anthony Chen, C-H-E-N, at lfnllc.com. Uh, or you can also visit our site at www.lfnllc.com. Terrific. Anthony Thanks for being with us, and we're looking forward to Family Business Radio. Thank you so so much. Yeah. So, folks, just a reminder here that uh, if you like this show and you want to listen to other episodes, we've got a archive of about 150 or 60 shows at this point, and over 400 guests, or close to 400 guests anyway, uh, that you can find at NorthFultonBusinessRadio.com. Uh, we also are on all the major podcast platforms. That's Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Mine happens to be Overcast. Uh, so check it out. Check us out there. We always have good uh, guests like uh, Tim and Anthony uh, to offer on this show. You can also follow us on Twitter or on Facebook at North Fulton BRX. So for our guests, Tim Fulton with Small Business Matters and Anthony Chin with Lighthouse Financial Network. I'm John Ray. Join me next time here on North Fulton Business Radio. Renaissance Rewards Extra is the checking account that checks all the boxes. Roadside assistance? Check. Cell phone insurance? Check. More than 400,000 local shopping discounts? Check. Up to $25 per month in ATM refunds and a great rate? Check. All in an easy-to-use mobile app. To open an account or find out more about Renaissance Rewards Extra Checking, go to renaissancebank.com or visit us at any of our more than 190 locations throughout the South. Renaissance Bank. Understanding you. Member FDIC. Equal housing lender.